Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Thursday Colloquium Seminar Series. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Lele Peng. She's our colleague. Uh, she's an SSHA professor uh, in College of Optical Sciences and leads a research group uh, mainly focusing on biomedical imaging. Her research interests are in inventing and building new fluorescence imaging tools for biomedical research, specifically in terms of developing new super resolution microscopy methods, which I believe will be the topic of uh, today's discussion for live, weed, uh, live white field imaging on membrane resident or, or near membrane structures, and also for developing uh, high resolution multicolor fluorescence lifetime imaging methods in deep tissue for live imaging of complex protein interactions at the cell level and whole organ in whole organisms. Uh, Dr. Penn's group has full research capability, uh, sorry, ability of conceiving new imaging techniques, building instruments, applying new techniques to collaborative biological studies. They maintain close collaborations with multiple research uh, groups in the system biology, developmental biology, and genetics. Through these collaborations, they have been, they have, they're applying our unique uh, advanced imaging techniques of to fundamental questions remaining in the biomedical research. Our research field and cancer research. So with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Peng, who will be talking about 3D super resolution imaging with stimulated emission depletion structured elimination microscopy. Thank you. Thank you. So hello, everyone. I think a lot, a lot of you already know me. I, my main appointment is here in the College of Optical Sciences. Just I have a by courtesy appointment in cellular molecular biology. It's because a lot of our technique we are working on actually we can apply to a fundamental research about living systems. So that's why I have a courtesy appointment there. Um, so today I'm going to talk about super resolution microscopy, really how to image, get a resolution, image resolution beyond diffraction limit. Uh, many of you may already know this is actually is the topic of 2014 Nobel Prize of Chemistry and shared by three persons, Albert Sieg, Stephen Howe, and William William Warner. So don't ask me why it's chemistry, but I think it should be, uh, uh, unfortunately we don't have uh, the bar price in optics. So <laughs> I kind of have to settle down with chemistry. Um, so, but then I also want to mention another person here, Matt Gustafsson, who unfortunately died in 2011. So my opening, I think also many people in the field feel like if he has, he, if he didn't die so early, he should be one on the, on the world list. Um, so how do we, get a resolution beyond the diffraction limit. Actually, first, what is the diffraction limit? This is the average diffraction equation, and uh, it's basically derived from calculating the diffraction pattern of uh, uh, infinite kind of collimated beam and focus through a uh, high uh, lens. And since light is away, we can't just focus the wave down to a f finite point. We end up with this shape of focal volume. And for laterally, we have a, a V that uh, defined by the RB limit. And also vertically, also have a kind of um, axle RB limit, dif uh, diffraction limit. So what it does is if you have two light source in the infinite distance, and when take an image of them, uh, imagine that taking an image of a star, you're not going to end up with two points. You're going to have a two hour disk overlay each other with uh, some overlap. And when they reach the reach really limit, you barely be able to disagree them. And below the really limit, you won't be able to tell them apart. So that becomes the resolution limit. So if you kind of view this picture in the spatial domain, that means if you have an object, take an image through an uh, image system. The image system has a PSF, a points by function, and this convolution relationship and the final image is not going to be as sharp. It's going to be the, uh, blurred by the PSF. Or if I, so basically if what is, is the function limit, if you think about the spa spatial domain, and then we can see that diffraction blurs the image. And also, if you want to break a diffraction limit, that means we want to make the PSF narrower, and narrower than the, the, the RB limit. So that has the idea of Stephen Howe's work. Is he used a process called a stimulant emission depletion. So if you ignore the depletion term, I think a lot of you have, all, all of you have seen this word. And still be emission. So basically, if you excite or for what we're talking about for here, because in there you can do super resolution in any image modality, 
But uh, fluorescence happens to be very useful in biomedicine research and has the most widely ab application. That's why I mean, my fo talk was focused on fluorescence now. So if you take a four for excited, and the fluorophore is going to go back to the ground state through spontaneous emission. And spontaneous emission is a broad spectrum. But then if you introduce the stimulated emission beam, what it happens is some of the photon is going to be emitted through the stimulated emission process. And if I increase that stimulated power, and I end up with moving all the photons to this stimulated emission wavelengths, and in the meantime, spontaneous emission is depleted. So um, the, the word is kind of confusing. It's not depleting the stimulated emission. Actually, the depletion happens on the spontaneous emission. So if I choose my filter correctly and I only detect this in this wavelength, I will see actually my emission actually become dark. It's sort of like magic using light to turn off light. And see, this is what my excitation uh, warm look like in the laterally, uh, because the diffraction I can't just focus down that way, no, it's more than that. And within this area, I have a spontaneous emission. But if I overlay this spot with a kind of a ring shape, a st a st a stimulated emission beam, and then in this area, all the, the wavelengths are going to shift to stimulated emission wavelengths. And if I use a green filter, all I see is my PSF actually becomes smaller. So how do you generate this ring shape? And you figure out, so the way you generate it is and you have sending your depletion laser through this helical uh, two pi face plate. And through the focus, you end up with an optical vortex that surrounding this focused excitation beam. And then you know, if you think about this way, when you can move this, uh, this complex uh, donuts plus excitation around, you perform point scan. And that gives you very fine PSF and allow you to image at a resolution better than the RB limit. So that's the idea of uh, STAD. But I want to remind you later on, if you look at the name of STAD, it's a physical process. It's not has nothing to do with the image. It can take a shape of a donut. But uh, in our work, actually, we use this effect in a diff very different way. So the second method that's developed by William Moller and also Andrew Bessy, because William Moller gets the reward most because he apparently understood on single molecule imaging. And then Andrew Bessy come up with this kind of localization idea that allow you to do super erosion. So this method is based on localization of single molecules. So if you take a sample, that for example, it is decorated by many, many fluorophores. And so, and then because we have a resolution limit, we won't be able to tell them apart. But if you somehow have a way to turn, keep most of the floor for dark and randomly turn on several floor for us here, and they are, uh, in the way that they are so sparse, you will see individual PSF of that floor for. You can certainly fit the PSF from the center of that PSF. That becomes the location of that individual floor for so molecules. Then you just do this random switch on game many, many times, accumulating many. Uh, enough counts on the single molecules. In the end, you can merge them together for a super solution image. So this is how that happens. This is the raw image for localization. Microscopy, you have individual PSF for single molecules. You localize them, and they go in through this tens of hundreds of time, and you end up with a map of floor for that's very fine the resolution. On the contrary, if you just do regular image, and that was very blurry kind of image. So this is the single molecule localization method. But then we want to go back to the fundamentals of so how we understand the diffraction limit in the Frunxy domain. And we can view this target or the sample structure. And if you take a Fourier transform, that means we view this time this uh, sample as a, 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 the sum of many, many Frunxy patterns. And then if you take a Fourier transform PSF and now with OTF, that basically is a band pass. It's a low, a low pass filter. And then the, the image you get in the frequency domain is, is, is the uh, product of object times OTF. So basically OTF is a low pass filter. You're starting to lose high frequency component. So basically it means that uh, if you think about those things in the frequency domain, it's a f basically with that diffraction cuts of high frequency information. 
But then that is how it cuts off the high frequency information. Just take a simple case. If I have a poor, uh, like a object that is actually grading with only one way, uh, frequency component, I shine light in that, I'm going to end up with diffraction orders. And then you, uh, if the diffraction order is not widely spread, I should be able to collect it with, uh, the, uh, within the NA of my lens and form an image at infinity. But if the grading is, has really high frequency component, the diffraction order is going to miss the lens. You won't be able to see it here. So that's, that way you start to lose high frequency information. You could actually focus your light with the lens so that uh, you shine the, the, this particular light that goes in the angle to this object. Then the things will become slightly better. You may be able to catch one side of the diffraction, but not the other side. In this case, the information is partially cut off. You are losing efficiency, but still will be able to resolve the, uh, the, the, this frequency somehow. But remember, this illumination lens also is limited by NA. This is basically the best, the largest angle I can shine light on. That means if I go with even higher frequency, then eventually diffraction order is going to miss the collecting lens completely. So I think that to say diffraction limit cuts, a diffraction cuts of high frequency information is not very accurate. And the real way to see that is the lens pupil cuts of high frequency information. Diffraction actually sending all information out, but we just couldn't collect all of them all. So in that sense, Super illusion, if you look at RB diffraction limit or the really criteria, the whether it's 0.5 factor or 0.61 is not very important. The most important thing is it tells you when you have this limiting collecting high frequency information, then your resolution is going to depend on the NA. And uh, as long as NA is in the picture, you are somewhat limited by diffractions. So in that case, the breaking diffraction limit is actually how do we recover the high frequency information beyond the numerical aperture. So that in a way that we can see that in an image system, uh, in a super resolution image system, our resolution is only decided by noise and the photon budget, how many photons you have, not by the numerical aperture. So it's like, say, give me, my, give me enough photons that I can reach an unlimited resolution. So based on that notion, you can view that, to say if you have a sample with certain frequencies, what happens when we illuminate a sinus or the emission pattern on the sample? You're going to end up with this complex uh, kind of illumination pattern, but then since the imaging forming the OTF is low pass filter, all you can see is the Moyer pattern of the low frequency uh, beating pattern. But again, if I sp scan my uh, Illumination is three steps in this case, and go through some calculation. I should be able to recover the original diffraction limit from this from this space, and also to actual space next to them uh, to the original the diffraction limit. So that allowed me to expand my Fourier bandwidth by a factor of two. So this is the idea of linear structural emission microscopy, for developed by Max Gustafsson, and then. This actually can, can be very successful, even actually later on, Gustafsson extended it into 3D uh, implementation. This is the 3D data, 3D linear thing. And if you want to take an image like that, GE sells a microscope using the 3D linear sim um, technique. And, but then in this linear sim approach, the resolution is half of the diffraction limit. So somehow the NA is still in the picture. <laughs> so a lot of people think that whatever you have NA in the picture, it's not a real super illusion. So how do we go to real super illusion with structural illumination? Let's assume that we have a sinusoid pattern, but then that sinusoid pattern generates some nonlinear effect. And then when I look at the effective illumination pattern here, it combi combines many, many frequencies. So we can inject many frequencies into this detection system. We have the diffraction limited linear thing and also second harmonic, third harmonic, and even more of this nonlinear um, um, effect. So that means that if I take enough scan, take many, many exposures by shipping this, uh, this uh, sample, I should be able to expand our full current frequencies even further. 
So you can see that here, where you don't get free launch if you want to do super elution. You need, will need end up with more acquisition. And um, uh, so, but then again, that's true giveaway. That's a way to kind of expand it in this case, expand the free space in this direction and enhance the resolution around this axis. And then if you want to go to 2D, one way you can do that is you rotate your pattern and uh, to do the same measurement around a different direction, and then later on stack them up to cover the entire 2D space. So that's the idea of nonlinear structure elimination, and in there it should give you non unlimited resolution. As long as the high harmonics, the term of the nonlinear effect is above the noise floor. So they ha this has been done with many nonlinear effects. So one thing about the nonlinear semi is it doesn't say which nonlinear effect you can use. As long as we figure out a way to do that. So this is done with Gustafsson first with statute excitation. And um, and this is a, like a paper a year half ago and do um, done with um, photo switching floor force. So you can see that the nonlinear sim definitely increases your resolution beyond the uh, like linear sim and also the diffraction limit. So what is the, the pros and cons of existing tools? If we go back to the first, the, the scanning down at a, a stat microscopy, that basically you kind of try to shrink down the PSF. It's the the advantage of this is almost all floor floor has a stimulated emission effect. So you can use a lot of floor force to do super erosion. And if you, it's a point scan technique, so if you want to do a small area, it can be very fast. But then the drawback is, and to do that, to reach a, like a, a high resolution, usually this kind of scanning state micro, microscope will use a very high intensity field in 100 milliwatts per square centimeter. And also because it's a scanning method, if you do larger field of view, then you're going to end up be slower. You could try to multi foci scanning, but if you think about the energy per foci and multiply by the number of foci, you end up with very high laser power. And that is not very favorable for biological samples. Um, so, so Stanley Hill actually have another version. So instead of trying to manipulate the fluorescent emission photon, he tried to use this donor to manipulate four for itself. So there are four for you can turn off with light to make it dark. So in that way, he can get away with much less light. But then the drawback is the switching of floor floor is actually a chemical reaction, so it's much slower. And when you do scanning uh, scan, you want the, the sample response to your movement of laser very quickly. So if you go with this floor floor switching kind of donut approach, the image speed is going to be slow, lower. And also you are limited by very lim a few choice in terms of fluorescence label. So what's the limitation in single molecule localization? You can see that in this uh, illustration, single molecule localization will accumulate individual flow force uh, over time. So uh, if you can, don't wait enough and end up with very sparse collection, then you, the image is not going to be able truthful to the real object. And but then the, the problem with super evolution is you don't know how your object should look like. And for unexperienced users, often you just end up with somewhere in between. And you can see continuous structure, especially continuous structure can be very fractured with localized, uh, single molecule localization. And but it does, it's very low cost because all you need is magnifier in front of your camera and some software. So it actually is widely used, but it's actually very hard to use because you have for every experiment a different sample. You have to kind of uh, fill in your way through the water and figure out the right condition to the end up with a, tr a cl uh, image closer to the to the target you want to see. So. In terms of nonlinear structural relation, the advantage is it's a full field image methods. It can be very fast. And also it has, because the model, the image model is mathematically very strict. And in the end, you actually have less artifacts. So you don't even need to deal with the uncertainty with molecule localization. And also in there, you can use work with a lot of nonlinear effect. 
But then right now in the stage, the single nonlinear structural formation has some limitations. So we can talk about those one by one. The first is actually to the point, to this point, there is no published image of with a single molecule with nonlinear thing. So this is the only published result. You can see those are single molecules imaging on the right traditional microscope. And then when you apply nonlinear thing on it, you end up with a streak like a lot of artifacts. So they can, uh, in the paper, they said that you can see this, this is the effect whenever the number of molecules per uh, like pixel decreases. So in the end, meaning that in this particular approach, they would just nonlinear sim, this, this nonlinear sim approach that just couldn't handle very sparse labeled sample. And also, because we talk when we introduce the theory, we we'll predict that if we go with higher harmonics, we should have very high, even higher resolution. But then, if you can see the record publication and the highest harmonic order we can reach, a nonlinear sim can reach a kind of stays on third harmonics after ten years. So really, why we can't reach higher resolution with with the higher harmonics? And the third part, the third limitation actually is the most damage. This is a pay, uh, image from the uh, um, 2015 paper. So on the full view, that looks, the image looks beautiful. But if I zoom in, you see artifacts. So this is always only one thing with the same. Whenever something goes wrong, you're going to have artifacts along your illumination pattern. And if you zoom into the another area, and actually, because this time the, the, the fibers are much dimmer, so you actually see more artifacts. So this is actually from autofocus light, because if you apply this to a large sample, nothing is flat. You, um, if, uh, unless you try to do turf, you always have autofocus light. But now, when, we when I introduced the theory, I keep showing OTF in 2D dimension. So no linear sim is a 2D image method. It can filter out some autofocus light, but uh, when it leaks, it leaks along the spatial frequency of the emulation pattern. And that can be very damaged when you try to apply the imaging on a sick tissue. So what we want to do, actually, what we're going to do here, here is actually using another way to do nonlinear sim. And our results were sure that I can address all those um, challenges with a new effect apply to things. So, so we're going to apply STAT, not in a dumbass, but uh, in nonlinear SIM um, framework. So if I kind of plot uh, this existing SIM method and also our method in this table here, you can see that it forms a nice variety of choice. Uh, you can, in terms of nonlinear effect, you can base on nonlinear effect on the 404. So using light to manipulate the 404, make it darker or brighter, or um, dark or active. Or you can use light to manipulate the photon emission. So, and um, so all three, I mean, the, all those in these four blanks here, all three have been done, but still hasn't been done yet. I mean, until we did, we do this. Um, the reason is that um, when you talk about stat, people just think about the donuts and the intense power. And if you want to do a stat with nonlinear sim, because nonlinear sim is a wide field image method, we have to spread out our laser power into a larger area. And I just couldn't buy a laser more powerful, and I would have to use the same laser used for that to focus in donut microscopy. So if you do the math, you end up with very weak electric, uh, electric field, a static field, and you're not going to get a very strong static effect. And uh, so that is actually very counterintuitive. So how how going to do better with the uh, 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 effect that traditionally requires intense light. So, and also here you can also see there is, in terms of choice of nonlinearity, you can do so called saturated activation that if you push nonlinearity up, making the sample, you can make the sample even brighter. And but that actually is a depletion effect, meaning that you have, if I push the nonlinearity and uh, with a dark, very dark sample, or a dark image, raw data. So actually, that also is a counterintuitive problem. How are you going to get a better performance out of very noisy, dark raw data? 
So we're going to answer that we're kind of in a few steps. So first, when we talk about the performance, we said there were um, no linear I mean there is an limited resolution as well as the harmonics is about noise floor. So the first question I have to ask is what cost for noise in nonlinear scene? So you have two choices. You can man manipulate the floor for make it dark or bright, or you can manipulate the photon emission process. But then both processes are stochastic that uh, hold on. Let me go back. So process process is kind of a random process. You have S and R square root of n. But you have asked this engine, what is the n here? It turns out that if you choose manipulate four four, your n is number of four fours. If you choose to manipulate photon emission process, your n is found um, a number of photons. So in all process emission uh, imaging, you always try to get multiple photons out of one floor four. So in that sense, the n on the right is always larger than the n on the right, on the left. And the SNR in raw data SNR in the radius uh, with this photon emission manipulation is always better. So you can see studies in this category. And also the consequences is if you, you know, n is the number of four for what you can have single molecules, it always has SNR equals to one. You just couldn't image it at all. So that means also with, with uh, a nonlinear effect in this category, we should be able to image single molecules. <laughs> So that also explains why in this particular approach, this is about the photon switchable floor for depletion effect. That's why single molecules show up really kind of with full of artifacts here. But it doesn't mean everything on this category will work. If you look at the saturation activation, meaning that you excite the floor for so strong, uh, strongly, and that generate actually generate very strong bleaching. So that actually is not is this matter is not very practical at all. So that leaves us the only choice with the stat. But again, also if we compare the choice of nonlinearity in the rows, we can do saturation activation or depletion. So in terms of saturation, uh, saturated activation, you're going to have stronger signal, very bright raw image. And in the raw data, because we have more photons, you actually have more good SNR. And then when you do the depletion, you actually throw out some signals. Uh, you, the, the raw data actually is full of dark spaces filled on up with camera noise. So the raw data actually looks very poor in SNR. But then, um, if you think about closely, actually in super resolution, not all signals are helpful. The goal of the super resolution is to capture the uh, signals that are beyond the diffraction limit. In this case, the diffraction limit signal is not very helpful at all. So we go ahead and analyze this what kind of uh, signal we have in a, a nonlinear effect. And this is a nonlinear depletion effect. So we can do a Taylor expansion on the old orders. And obviously, all the Taylor coefficient related to this one related to the second harmonic effect, and this one related to the third harmonic effect. But also, we have this DC term. So that DC term give you a, effectively give you, means you have a uniform relation on the sample, and that gives you the diffraction limit to the information. So, so they can see that how that related together. So when we compare the active, uh, depletion effect with this twin uh, activation effect, and using the sinus wave pattern, now with a pattern like this, as I push nonlinearity up this with depletion effect, I end up with a very dark space between each uh, zero points. And then here I have a very bright image uh, all over. But then if I do a tidal expansion and look at the harmonics, you can see that the uh, first and second order high harmonics orders are the same. The only difference is the DC term. So activation looks bright because it has a very high DC signal. And that leads to a very strong diffraction limited photon signal. And just keep in mind that uh, even though signal stays in limited fringe, uh, fringe space like this, the noise is a wide spectrum and spread out to everywhere. So if you have a very strong diffraction limit signal, the noise actually going to bleed into, into all the high, high frequency signals. So in other words, that means that if you do activation, 
you basically selectively detect all signals. And you, uh, on the surface, you have more signal. But down into bottom, you have some signal that actually you don't want. And the noise from all that higher, more photons just makes the, uh, make the, the super resolution actually much harder. So in other words, it's, um, when we use a depletion effect, we only deplete away most of the diffraction-limited signal and also keep basically the useful signal are the same. And then we actually lower the noise floor. In other words, is if you look at this comparable nonlinear uh, effect, uh, using STAT, we should be able to kind of beat the noise signal with the even lower noise floor. So that becomes our motivation for building uh, the STAT nonlinear seam uh, microscope. This is our microscope look like roughly. We use a super continuum, one megahertz quantum laser, then pick out the two wavelengths, one for excitation and the red shift the uh, wavelengths for stat. And then we generate using the two, so first the split the polarization, and then using two gradients to generate a four beam emission pattern, and course them onto the sample to form a two dimensional pattern. And then the excitation actually comes as apu excitation from the center of the pupil here. And then the emission is captured by a camera. So in this case, we actually did a um, uh, nonlinear SIM in a slightly different way. Traditionally, a nonlinear SIM is, due, is done by one dimensional kind of pattern and then the rotate pattern in sequence. So in the end, you uh, build up the string space in this kind of rotating pattern. And you can notice that in the center area, the low function area have a lot of redundancy. And that basically means you have kind of waste some acquisition and marry the low frequency component again and again. So what we did is we have two emission patterns, X direction and Y direction. We overlay them incoherently, so end up with kind of this 2D emission pattern. And then we do a 2D phase shifting on the emission pattern to acquire multiple exposure. After the process, we build up the, the uh, those front space space in this kind of orthogonal pattern, and then very limited overlapping between each other. That means that to get the same resolution, we should we need less exposure, and if you compare the exposure number we need with uh, the exposure number, you, you the, the rotating method need actually we only when the edge is high, we're going to have the advantage in terms of image speed. And this actually was proposed a long time ago, which is um, we were the first uh, group to implement it. But then the risk here is that in, the, in the kind of diagonal direction in this front space, you, the harmonic strength is a little bit less. So there is a risk of an isotropic resolution. But we'll only test that later on with experiment data. So this is our experiment data. It's a, so on the uh, left, you see a cell image on the epilum lessons, regularly for essence imaging. And then on the right, you have see that the super resolution imaging with uh, uh, reach like third, uh, six order harmonics. But because the static beam is a Gaussian beam, so on the edge, you don't have much strong, or not, uh, not a very strong stat field. So you can see the resolution enhancement is not that significant. And so the resolution actually from the center to the edge and gradually change depending on the, the stat beam intensity. But in the, like the center region, we did, we reached the harmonic, uh, six harmonics. And then that's basically three orders higher than the previous work. So let's just do a resolution test. So take an area within the center field of view, and uh, we found this fiber. That is, this is a single uh, tubing fiber in the cell that uh, goes on and merges into a bigger fiber bundle. So first, we see the cross section of this single fiber. Is, it turns out to be roughly 70 nanometer. And because we already know through electric uh, microscopy that this single fiber should be about 24 nanometer in diameter, and our <laughs> predicted resolution based on the case-based calculation is a 53 nanometer. So the width we are getting roughly match the, the, the predicted value. But then, I mean, sometimes you actually can use deconvolution method to make single structures narrower. So the real goal of the task is actually the really task. As when we see, one can see here, we actually take a cro plot a cross section around this fiber junction, and we look at how the cross section evolves when we kind of uh, going through building up harmonic orders. 
can see that only when we add the six harmonics order, the highest harmonic order, that's when the fiber, single fiber becomes, become kind of be differentiated from the fiber bundle here. So that tells me that we, I, we did reach the six harmonics, and that gave us a resolution of 53 nanometer. So as I said before, there's a risk of uh, an asymmetry resolution. So we actually look at the fibers diagonal. diagonally in another cell, and blow it up. This is a single fiber that uh, on the right, left, you see the wide field that you couldn't distinguish as a fiber here. But with the super you can see a very dim single fiber here, and the profile actually is also roughly 65 nanometers, similar to what the number we get in the horizontal fibers. So that actually tells us that we are uh, in terms of signal to noise ratio, we do, did reach enough signal to noise ratio in that diagonal directions, and we have to basically reach the isotropic resolution. And the second challenge is, so we actually will be able to kind of extend the resolution. The second challenge we, I was I said earlier in nonlinear same is a single molecule. So this is a beads more immobilized in glass on glass, and when it's fresh and made, actually we found that the beads tends to blink. And just by observing the blinking behavior, you can see that we found uh, some bees actually is only labeled by one floor floor. So this is the camera noise floor, uh, the dark on floor here. And a few of them actually have two floor floors here. So when we do a super resolution imaging over these bees, what we find is it's hard to see here because um, the, the, it's, this, the, those are extremely dark. But if I increase the saturation level, and can see we kind of were able to de identify those beads. And if you look at the cross section of those beads, um, for this beads number one, we found that it's a single label with uh, about 49 nanometer resolution, uh, full width half maximum. And then beads number two actually becomes two beads uh, separated by a certain distance. And then number uh, beads number two is. Uh, it turns out to be two floor floors label on the same bees, so the floor is half maximum is a little bit larger because the bees is 20, micron, uh, 20 nanometer across. You can see that all those with this, we did re reach a single molecule sensitivity, and uh, on the result actually matched the expected uh, resolution. So when you turn back, those things you can look at what kind, how, how much stat power we used. We roughly used 10 nanojoules set of pulse over a wide field. So actually, um, and then if you compare this kind of donor scan scheme, usually they actually use one nanojoule set of pulse per focal, to, per focal point. So there's a big difference in terms of power we use here. We use much lower laser energy, much lower power. So, the div so you have to ask, how do you get super resolution with such little power? The difference is with the seam, actually, you take account that uh, your mission is a sinusoid pattern. You try to resolve all the harmonics of the sinusoid pattern. And you also build the image in the frequency, the continuous frequency space. But when you do kind of this kind of uh, donor scan, you actually approximate this donut as a shapeless probe. And also, you kind of pixelated space, you perform a pixelated scan. So in that sense, all those approximations, in, in, during making that approximation, you throw out some prior knowledge about the illumination shape, about the, uh, the, the donut shape itself, and how the static effect should look like with a donut. So in the end, if you want to reach a higher resolution, you should end up needing more power, a stronger effect. So, so if we go back to compare previous study, so what we did here was kind of this grid pattern, and on the surface is very similar to a previous work here, and here. But then the difference here, we interpret this pattern as a structural illumination pattern, and build up a resolution in the frequency domain. But here in this work, they are kind of interpret those individual points here as an independent donut. Uh, 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 interpret it as a multi foresight scanning and scan it digitally in a uh, spatial uh, domain. So the big difference is to get it to work, we only need 10 milliwatts of power, uh, total power. So the laser used in two cases are very similar in terms of repetition rate and the pulse duration. But we only need 10 milliwatts of power in this full field, but they need 1 watts of power in the full field. 
So one watt is actually, one watt is a big number. You will never be able to put it on a biologic sample. So this work is pretty much for the uh, demonstrate idea, but uh, um, just by, uh, uh, by doing kind of a, not taking advantage of all the information, you actually end up need more laser power. So we talk about harmonics, how to improve resolution with uh, more harmonics, uh, how to do single molecule image. And basically, with our new method, I can show you that uh, every, we can achieve both. Then the last item on the list is 3D super resolution. So how do we do 3D resolution? Actually, it's coming very easy. If you look at how we generate the interference pattern, we shine two lights, cross each other, add the sample. And if you use a CW light, because you have a strong coherence, and then you end up with an uh, interference pattern that extended over the axle. So you're not going to get super resolution at all, uh, super resolution around the axis. Uh, actual uh, direction at all. But uh, if you use a low current light, then the, the contrast is going to degrade once you go out of focus plane. And that, and then based on nonlinear effect, then the, the, the layer that we have a good pattern of nonlinear effect is going to be much narrower in the diffraction limit. So that, but then there's one catch though. If you choose the activation effect, and the, uh, in out of focus are, uh, layers, you can end up with uniform activation, a huge diffuse uh, out of focus background, and you're going to end up with a lot of artifacts. But what we use is depletion effects. So actually, in the out of focus layer, we have uniform depletion. We don't uh, don't have out of focus light at all. So that means that if you we actually go in and marry the uh, the fringe contrast of our interference pattern, and I found that this follows exactly on the predict of a incoherent, uh, incoherent source. And then, based on the stat field we have, and then you can do a little bit calculation, that means the contrast we have in the nonlinear effect is only like 290 nanometer. So, um, but that actually generally problem, meaning that in order to put my sample focus na precisely within this narrow section layer, we have to have auto-focusing and active focal um, tracking. So what we did is actually we sli split the camera view. We bring in kind of a half, or use half of the camera to detect the reflected starlight. And the track is, um, track is contrast all the time. Use that contrast to feed back to a sample stage to achieve autofocusing and also active focal tracking. So that gives us a, 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 a position about 50 nanometer. So then we can go ahead and try some really sick sample. This is a cell that kind of didn't spread out in the, on the glass. It's kind of kind of lumping up on the glass. If you look at the epiphysis um, imaging from the bottom layer to the top, you don't see much. It's very blurry. But when we kind of apply our SIM on it, take the raw data, before processing it, we just add all the raw data together, you already see the section effect. This is purely because the outer focus layer is, depl is depleted. And when we apply the super resolution mm, processing on it, you end up with a, a much finer resolution showing much detailed structure. So this actually is done with a slightly lower harmonics and take about three seconds per slice. So if you compare the original epifluorescence with the final product and see the big, big difference here. So you, you will be able to extract much more information from the, our technique. So in the end, uh, we think that the static, using static in nonlinear SIM has very, a lot of advantages. First, you have a, we actually have much lower light intensity compared to the scanning stat. And also because the SIGMI is based on camera, it's not been, it's a very high, higher dynamic range. You can see single molecule. And also can see very dense 3D cellular structures within, within the same setup. Nothing needs to be changed. And we can, this is why field imaging usually, because the field of view is limited by the laser, stat laser. You have a more powerful laser can spread out to a larger field view. And also, our, we do have a little bit of 3D uh, axial super resolution. It's not great, but it's coming almost free. And, um, and also, because study is very a general process, you have, can have a lot of label to use with. Also, in terms of scientifically, 
on stack theme it works because it, and although we have a lower noise, we even have a lower. Uh, so we have no signal, but you have a lower noise. So in the end, the SNR is always what matters, not just signal itself. And also, the lessons we're learning is we can you can achieve supervolution with a very weak static effect. But then in any direction, once you get your photon, the way you extract the information from the photon matters. If you choose a dark matter, then this is not an optimal way to extract information. You end up with a lot, uh, less resolution, or alternatively, you need a stronger effect. But here with the same kind of interpreted stat in a nonlinear same frame, we actually were, were able to fully recover the information and achieve a much better resolution with a very low uh, uh, laser field. So in the end, I want to thank my group members that who worked on this project, my collaborator in the cancer center. We are collaborating together to kind of apply, want to apply this technique to study cancer cell migration. And also another collaborator, Stanford Madison, to apply to for neural imaging. Thank you for your attention, and uh, I'm open for questions. Questions from the audience?